Hello, this is Philip Mies, here to present about data on psoriatic arthritis presented at the ULAR meeting 2011 in London. I'm associated with Seattle Rheumatology Associates. I'm director of the Rheumatology Research Program at Swedish Medical Center and clinical professor at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, Washington. The first study I would like to speak about uh, is one from a Swedish registry in which patients with ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis uh, were assessed uh, for the diagnosis of lymphoma. There were 14,706 ankylosing spondylitis patients and 20,013 psoriatic arthritis patients, so quite substantial. These were patients uh, that were uh, either inpatients during the years 1969 to 2007 or in specialist outpatient visits from 2001 to 2007. Two controls were randomly identified from the general population, which is possible to do in Sweden because of the nature of their healthcare registries, and matched to each patient by age, gender, and residence. What you can see in this table uh, is that there was not an increased relative risk of having lymphoma in either ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis both in the time period before anti-TNF medications were introduced and after they were introduced. So in contrast to our situation in rheumatoid arthritis, where we know that the risk of lymphoma is increased based on the disease state, in this very large registry study, it does not appear uh, that lymphoma uh, is an increased risk in psoriatic arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis. This is a, an important finding uh, and important for us in terms of counseling our patients about uh, risk and benefits of the uh, biologic medications. The next study I would like to present has to do with the application of the new rheumatoid arthritis acr ular criteria and how it fares in an early psoriatic arthritis and early rheumatoid population. Before getting into the study, I'd like to remind us uh, in the next slide about what the uh, criteria for classification of psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis are. The current criteria for psoriatic arthritis is known as the CASPAR criteria. Will Taylor was the lead author uh, of this publication in 2006. And as you recall, uh, psoriatic arthritis is defined as having established inflammatory musculoskeletal disease in the joint, spine, or enthesium with at least three of the following elements, current psoriasis, which actually gets two points at present, or a history or family history, which would get one point nail changes, a negative test for rheumatoid factor, dactylitis, or radiologic evidence of juxtaarticular new bone formation, each of which would get a point. Most patients come into the criteria by having current psoriasis and a negative test for rheumatoid factor. The rheumatoid arthritis ACR ULAR classification criteria published by uh, Daniel Ali Taha in Arthritis and Rheumatism in 2010 are uh, as noted in the table. The major changes from the 1987 criteria include the fact uh, that a patient can come into having a rheumatoid uh, arthritis diagnosis with lesser duration of, of disease, i.e. Uh, six weeks rather than three months. And there is greater weight in this criteria placed on distribution of joint involvement, uh, the presence of a positive rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP antibody uh, with some differentiation between low and high, and the presence of acute phase reactant uh, elevation. In a study uh, done in the, the Leeds uh, registry, Laura Coates 
uh, applied uh, both the CASPAR criteria and the new ACR ULAR RA criteria uh, to patients uh, with psoriatic arthritis and other forms of inflammatory arthritis. And what she found uh, in this uh, uh, exercise was that many patients with early psoriatic arthritis fulfilled uh, the new RA criteria. Now, when applying the new RA criteria, one of the rules is that you're supposed to assess the patient for other possible inflammatory uh, arthritis conditions, such as psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, lupus, and so forth, and, and rule those out. Uh, so this just emphasizes the point uh, that in early disease, the patient could uh, fall under the, uh, the RA criteria. Uh, in a separate abstract, uh, she noted uh, that uh, all of the early psoriatic arthritis patients were well characterized uh, by the CASPAR criteria, and none of the rheumatoid patients fulfilled this criteria. So the CASPAR criteria has both high sensitivity and specificity, whereas the RA criteria has good sensitivity uh, for early RA, uh, but but the specificity is lower. It was about 50% uh, uh, for uh, clearly uh, identifying rheumatoid disease versus psoriatic arthritis or other inflammatory arthritis. The next abstract I'd like to uh, discuss uh, has to do uh, with the prevalence of metabolic syndrome in psoriatic arthritis. This has been something that we've been learning much more about, about the basic disease state of psoriatic arthritis in the last few years. Uh, and in particular, we've been learning, for example, that psoriasis patients, as well as psoriatic arthritis patients, tend to be obese uh, and have problems with hypertension and diabetes uh, uh, and seem to uh, have more of a proclivity to this uh, than rheumatoid arthritis patients. This was assessed in the corona registry patients, and indeed, uh, this was confirmed. As you can see in the far right of this table, uh, there was a statistically significant higher percentage of patients with psoriatic arthritis who had metabolic syndrome, i.e. Uh, obesity, uh, hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, uh, than patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This is something that's important to keep in mind as we're managing our patients uh, and thinking about uh, downwind uh, cardiovascular com uh, comorbidities, uh, the importance of controlling controllable factors such as elevated cholesterol, encouraging weight loss, and also keeping in mind uh, the background issue that some of these patients can have fatty liver, uh, which may increase the likelihood of uh, a medication that has uh, toxic liver effects to have uh, liver problems in these patients. The next uh, study that I'd like to introduce uh, is the PRISTINE study. Uh, this was actually conducted uh, in dermatology centers, and the principal data uh, from this study has been presented at dermatology meetings. But there was also a um, uh, information from the study that was presented at the ULAR meeting, which I think is quite interesting for us to look at. I'll be going over this in the next four slides. The primary objective of this study was to compare the 50 milligram once a week with the 50 milligram twice a week dose of Inbrel given in the first 12 weeks, uh, followed by 50 milligrams thereafter in both arms of the study using Enbrel twice a week uh, uh, for the first 12 weeks uh, is allowable and on label uh, in the treatment of psoriasis uh, with Enbrel, whereas uh, it is not in psoriatic arthritis where the standard 50 milligram once a week dose is approved. Uh, the secondary objectives of this study were to look at uh, quality of life and pharmacoeconomic outcomes to assess the cardiovascular and metabolic risk profile of, of, of subjects uh, and uh, to assess safety. The next slide uh, shows the uh, randomization sequence where half of the patients of the total of 273 subjects uh, received either uh, etanercept 
50 milligrams once weekly or twice weekly uh, for the first 12 weeks, followed by 50 milligrams weekly in both arms. Uh, and there was some liberalization of topical steroids that could be allowed in the uh, second 12-week uh, period, and I'll just make a small point about that later on. Some interesting features uh, about the uh, baseline characteristics of the population is shown in this next slide. The patients had severe psoriasis, uh, 21 uh, average PASI score. A third of their body surface area was covered with psoriasis lesions. And interestingly, 31% of the patients in this cohort had uh, psoriatic arthritis. If you look at um, some of the comorbid issues, such as BMI, it was found to be elevated, uh, uh, roughly uh, 29. And it was similar in the patients with psoriatic arthritis and those who did not have psoriatic arthritis. Diabetes, uh, on the other hand, was present in 21% of the psoriatic arthritis patients and only 9% of the uh, patients without psoriatic arthritis. Hypertension was also uh, much greater in frequency in the psoriatic arthritis patients, 62% versus 27% in the patients that did not have arthritis. Metabolic syndrome uh, occurred in similar frequency between the patients that did and did not have psoriatic arthritis. And as one might imagine, uh, there was more impaired quality of life uh, worse fatigue and work productivity in the patients that had the arthritis component uh, as well uh, versus the pure psoriasis group. So some of the results are shown in the next slide. The PASI 75 response at 24 weeks was quite good, 78% uh, in the original twice-weekly twice dosing for 12 weeks, uh, uh, followed by the uh, 50 milligrams once weekly, and 60% in those patients that received 50 milligrams throughout. Etanercept was equally efficacious in the skin in patients with pure psoriasis or those that also had the psoriatic arthritis component. And there was a low need for additional topical uh, steroid treatment or vitamin D cream uh, in either dose group in the second 12 weeks. There was significant improvement in a number of the cardiometabolic biomarkers, such as apolipoprotein B versus, uh, over apolipoprotein A1 ratio, HSCRP, and NT pro BNP. There was also more change in quality of life, fatigue, and work productivity in the patients that had psoriatic arthritis than in the pure psoriasis group, despite they're having worse baseline status uh, of these features. Both groups significantly improved with etanercept, and there were no new safety signals that emerged during this trial. The next slide uh, captures information uh, from a golimumab uh, uh, study uh, in psoriatic arthritis. We're now seeing long-term results uh, from the phase three uh, golimumab and PSA program. Uh, and here we're seeing some data out to two years. And in this uh, study uh, uh, by Artie Cavanaugh, it was noted uh, that there, in those patients that had early and sustained remission, uh, that this was associated uh, down the road with normalized function, quality of life, and improved work pro productivity, which I think is intuitive, but it's, it's good that this was demonstrated. The DAS28 remission uh, at uh, weeks 4, 14, and 104 were 16%, 31%, and greater than 50% respectively. So substantial improvements uh, noted over time. It was then found that subjects that were in remission had significantly higher chance of normalizing function, i.e. having a hack less than 0 0.5, and quality of life, uh, i.e. achieving a U.S. norm for the SF36 physical component and mental, mental component scores. And there was significantly improved work productivity in this group. My last slide uh, to go over uh, is a forward-looking one, and this has to do uh, with TH17 T cells 
uh, in uh, psoriatic arthritis in psoriasis patients. In this particular study, uh, there was flow cytometry of peripheral blood mononuclear cells in 32 psoriasis patients and nine patients with psoriatic arthritis compared to 40 controls. What was found uh, was that there was an uh, increase uh, percent of Th17 cells in both induced uh, and fresh PSA cells. What is meant by that is they studied the cells just at rest and then also after uh, inducing the cells with uh, IL-6, IL-23, uh, and IL-1. Uh, and what was found was that there were um, more patients uh, in the psoriasis group than in the control group who had Th17 cells and significantly even more in the patients that had psoriatic arthritis. IL-17 uh, was significantly increased. IL-17 is a cytokine product of Th17 cells, and it was significantly increased in these, uh, all of the psoriasis patients compared to controls. So this information emphasizes the important role of Th17 cells uh, in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and also points to the potential uh, for targeting uh, interleukin-17 as well as potentially interleukin-23 and IL-6, all of which are uh, active in this particular uh, pathway of uh, cellular inflammation. Uh, and it points to the possibility uh, that agents that are targeting uh, this pathway may uh, be efficacious uh, and helpful for us in the future, especially in those patients uh, that are not having an, uh, an adequate response to TNF. These were some of the uh, important uh, uh, and, I hope, uh, practical uh, abstracts uh, that were uh, presented at ULAR about psoriatic arthritis. Thank you very much for your attention.